Hey guys, welcome to Laugh Napkin. On today's episode of Pro Revenge, we have some smug, holier-than-thou parents that took advantage of their foster child's inheritance, but then gets their reputation wrecked in the end. And after that, we have a bridesmaid that decided it was a good idea to announce her own engagement at her friend's wedding. And she gets a brutal taste of her own medicine months later. If you're new to my channel, subscribe for dailies. Now let's get into it. My foster parents treated me like crap, so I obliterated their reputation in our small town. My parents were both killed in a hit and run car accident when I was 10. My dad was only 39 and my mom 35. Neither of them had relatives who could take me in. We lived in a really small church going town where everyone knew one another. My dad had been the heir to a small fortune and so didn't really have to work. He didn't like the big city, so him and my mom decided to move to a small town where he could have an antique store. My mom was into collecting antiques. I would have had to go the orphanage route when they died, but this couple from the church, who I'll call Mr. and Mrs. Banks, made this big to-do in the church about how a little girl needs a loving home, and God has given us this joyous task of bringing her up in our home and hearts. It's been a long time, and I don't remember if those were Miss Banks' exact words, but they were something cringeworthy like that. The Banks had their own daughter, Kitty, who was a year older than me. That should have meant that we would be super good friends, but Kitty had her own thing going and practically ignored me. She was a holier-than-thou type. The Banks received a stipend from the state to take care of me, but they also received checks every month from my dad's estate which was supposed to take care of me until I was 18. When I did turn 18, I would receive full control of my inheritance. The banks weren't exactly cruel to me, but in private, it was clear that they were using me to build up their reputation in town. In front of other people, they'd fawn over me in a sick cotton candy fashion that made me uncomfortable. They'd also make Kitty be nice to me in public, which she resented. The banks would also put on a big show every time social workers came to check up on me. They'd coach me before the lady would come and tell me to praise how godly and wonderful they were. After the social worker left, they'd go right back to ignoring me and spending my dad's money on crap on the internet or on trips. It was clear to me, even as a tween and teen, that the banks were only using some of my endowment, both from the state and from my trust, to take care of me. The rest they spent on themselves. As I grew older, I could see that my foster parents would pretend as though they had a great business acumen, and that's why they had more money, and could buy a new Volvo, and take a trip to New York, and buy fancy clothes for Kitty. When I was 17, I noticed that my foster parents were stockpiling away my trust fund money to pay for Kitty's tuition to college. Throughout this time, the banks would never outright say so, but would heavily imply that I owed them, and once I got control of my inheritance, that I should be godly and generous and give them some material compensation for all the work they did to raise me. I think they already got lots of material, especially since Mrs. Banks practically stole all my mom's antiques from her store and kept them for herself gave them to Kitty or to other relatives. One thing my mom never kept at her store was an extremely expensive Baroque era fine china set, absolutely complete and worth tens of thousands of dollars. Not a replica, but the real deal. So real Napoleon Bonaparte himself might well have eaten a steak off those plates. Probably not, but you get the point. It was my china set of course. But Mrs. Banks thought I was an idiot and didn't know that. She would always talk about how this china set will go to Kitty on her wedding day. Mrs. Banks assumed that since I always dressed like a tomboy, I didn't care about all of my mom's antiques that Mrs. Banks stole or gave away, or that I just didn't care about the china sets. When I was a kid, my mom told me that things were things and not to obsess over them. So not having the frou-frou china set for myself wasn't an issue. What was an issue was Mrs. Banks acting like it was all hers to give away. Wrong lady. So once Kitty went off to college, thanks to my biological mom and dad's money, I had to make my own plans. 
I had always done well in school and had actually gotten a partial scholarship to attend school out of state. The rest I could easily pay for with my inheritance, which I would very soon have control of. Per usual, Mr. and Mrs. Banks were haranguing me about how I owed them compensation, and since I was going to be rich soon, I ought to share the wealth. I figured that over the past seven years, they probably stole or misappropriated more than $200,000 of my parents' money, to say nothing of the state money they misused. I think they more than shared the wealth. I never promised anything. I just smiled and kept a tally of every single bank statement I got them quarterly that my trust issued over the years. The bank's family never shared them with me, of course, but when I asked the actual bank for a rundown, they were more than happy to oblige. I also wrote down every single major purchase my foster parents clearly made over the past seven years with money that was clearly beyond their means as a housewife and insurance salesman. Things such as a $40,000 car for cash, a used $20,000 car for cash that they gave to Kitty, trips to Hawaii, New York, cash gifts to the church that made them look super generous at my deceased parents' expense. I kept it all in a nice three-ring binder. I already arranged my travels to my new campus. I didn't have much stuff at the bank's house anyway, and had zero intention of coming back, at least to their home. The banks knew I was leaving, but didn't bother seeing me off because they assumed I'd come back to give them their due. I waited for our church's yearly antique sale extravaganza, set to begin in three days. Per usual, the banks donated all sorts of random stuff, many of it knickknacks that used to belong to my mom and technically belonged to me. They weren't shy about giving my stuff away and taking credit for it. While Mr. and Mrs. Banks were on one of their shopping sprees with my parents' money and away from their house, I boxed up the china set and brought it to the church. I told the rummage sale committee that Mrs. Banks wanted to donate the priceless antiques for sale, all benefits to go to the church. This donation is made in the name of Mr. and Mrs. Banks. I was being fair. If Mrs. Banks was really so godly, she would be delighted that such a wonderful donation would be made in her name. Sadly, I knew she'd go the other way because she was faker than porn star implants. The ladies were flabbergasted, especially when I told them the appraisal of the set's value. I also told them that if they needed proof of ownership and right to sell, to contact the number of a certain attorney in New York. They thanked me profusely and praised the Lord Jesus for Mrs. Banks' generosity. This would be the most expensive item in their sales history. Everyone knew no one could afford to buy the set outright but everyone would love to buy the pieces piecemeal. Like, I got a cup and saucer, or I got one of the chargers, I got an egg cup. The banks were supposed to work the sale the second day and I wasn't there. What I did hear was that my foster mom went ballistic when she saw her china set for sale and that it was a huge hit and ladies from all over the county had bought pieces of it and it raised so much money for the church. My foster mom threw a tantrum and said that I had stolen the set from her house. The ladies at the church explained that I had made the donation in her name and she was getting credit for the donation to the church. My foster mom was practically yanking her hair out according to what I heard later. She was trying to track down who had bought pieces and trying to get them back. Of course, she was unsuccessful. What she was successful in was looking like a grade A douche canoe. The entire church thought she was selfish and materialistic and acting very ungodly, especially the way she cursed her foster daughter. A week later, my foster parents received a package by registered mail from me and my attorney. It contained my binder, where I showed my bank statements and also a list of all their spending extravagances. It also contained a warning from my attorney that should they ever try to contact me again for money, that they will receive a bill and a court date. That was that. Ten years later, I work as a third grade teacher. I'm married to an accountant, and we have a three-year-old son and one-year-old daughter. Kitty ended up working through college, and as we've gotten older, we've reconnected. She apologized for the way she acted when we were kids. We're friends now and see each other multiple times a year, often just for lunch. She's an elementary school teacher too 
and married to an engineer. She has a four-year-old daughter, and both of our older kids play together when our families meet. We both have our own wedding china. She has gone to a lot of therapy due to her toxic parents, she tells me. As for her parents, they still live in their small town because they're too broke to move. Their reputation is of being that couple who drove both their children away and stole money from that poor little girl whose parents died. And they tried to steal money from Jesus when they whined about getting their Baroque china back. I hope your Volvo is worth it, a-holes. Don't announce your engagement at someone else's wedding, or this might just happen to you. Last summer, I was at a cousin's wedding. His bride and her family had been close with ours since before I was born, and the couple had known each other since they were toddlers. So it was a particularly exciting event for both sides of the family. However, after the ceremony was over and the party had only just started, one of the bridesmaids decided to announce her own engagement. The attention was immediately taken away from the newlyweds and brought to the bridesmaid, who I'll call Sarah, and her equally smug fiancé. My cousin's wife, I'll call her Emma, didn't make a scene or utter a single negative word about Sarah. She looked like she was on the verge of tears, but she kept grinning and acted very happy for the other couple. This was unusual, as Emma is typically quite confrontational and speaks her mind no matter the consequences. Sarah later picked Emma to be the maid of honor at her own wedding, which took place last weekend. I wasn't there for it, but my cousin sent me some of the best bits on Snapchat and explained the whole situation. This is where the fun begins. Emma's two much younger sisters were the flower girls at Sarah's wedding. At the very last moment, Emma switched out the white petals in their baskets to blue ones that she had secretly brought with her. She told her sisters not to say anything about it or let the bride see them until it was time to scatter them down the aisle. Sarah looked very confused upon seeing the blue petals, which didn't coordinate whatsoever with her theme. But of course she didn't say anything about it in the moment. Most of Sarah's other bridesmaids were also Emma's friends, had attended Emma's wedding, and were in on Emma's scheme. At the reception, Emma's sisters and the other bridesmaids were tight-lipped when Sarah began demanding to know why there were blue petals. The wedding planner ended up getting a lot of abuse for not checking the flower girl's baskets before they walked down the aisle. Finally, it was time for the speeches. The speeches took place in front of a massive screen, displaying a loop of photos with Sarah and her husband, which had been compiled by Emma. Emma took the remote and controlled the presentation screen and at first showed some pre-approved humorous photos of Sarah with Emma and her other friends to facilitate a couple lighthearted jokes. Then, at the very end, Emma said to Sarah that she must have been wondering why there were blue petals instead of the white ones originally planned. That was when Emma displayed the last slide from her presentation. Emma announced in front of everyone that she was five months pregnant and that she just discovered the baby was a boy, hence the blue petals. The last slide was her ultrasound picture. There were shocked yells and gasps. Sarah had a fit, but those that were involved in the scheme cheered so loudly that I sincerely regretted watching the Snapchat recordings with headphones. Apparently, Sarah had been very nasty to her bridesmaids before, driving several of them away and forcing the others to pay ridiculous amounts of money for dresses. Emma and her cousins were eventually thrown out of the party, but they were all smiles. Sarah's fuming mother went to confront her outside, and Emma retorted with, Gentle, gentle, I'm pregnant. I reckon Sarah doesn't speak to the majority of those bridesmaids anymore. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed making it. Big shout out to everyone that has subscribed to this channel as you're the ones making these daily videos possible. See you guys in the next video.